Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Menachem Ben Baum Hefetz. Uh, Menachem completed his Bachelor, Master's, and PhD studies at the Geological and Environmental Sciences at Ben Gurion University, University of Nigel. Uh, he conducted his PhD studies under the supervision of Professor Chaim Benimini. And his research is concentrated on paleo-oceanography, paleo-gene, calcareous nanoplankton, paleo-ecology of microfutures. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Um, as Regina said, this is a part of my PhD thesis, so it's only a part of it. And if you'd like to have more data, please uh, feel welcome to call me. I'll give you more. So this is our, only the highlights of the thesis. The calcareous nanofossil assemblages and the paleo-oceanography of the Levant region in the Eocene, as Regina said, is supervised by Professor Chaim Benjamini in Ben Gurion University of the Negev. And let us begin first with the Eocene. The Eocene is the time between 56 million years before present and 33.9 million years before present. It has started with an abrupt change in temperature, rising temperature, that is calling the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. And then, throughout the early Eocene, temperatures were rising up to 12 degrees or even more than the, the average of today. This is in the early EOC. They've reached the maximum in about 50 to 49 million years before present in an event that is called the Early Eocene Climate Optimum, the EECO. And then a global change started in the middle EOC. Temperature began to decrease. They were decreasing by several stages, cooling events, stable events, one more time cooling, one more year stable, and then when we approached the late Eocene, temperatures were decreasing very much towards the Oligocene, as you might have heard. The Oligocene was the time, the, 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 the Eocene Oligocene boundary was the time of a global change in all Earth climates and paleoceanography. Now, something about coccolithal force. Coccolithal force are producers of carbonate in the Paleogene and also in present. If you look at the time scale, this is the Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, and as I said, it's about 50 million years before present. Crossing the KT boundary is a small genus, it's called Biscutum, a very small and primitive one that was uh, existed in the Cretaceous and has managed to um, cross the KT boundary, and then he changed. He changed to several genus genera. The one is the genus Reticular Fenestra, which is called because of the fenestra. You, you see here, the central opening is real, reticulated. And then, the Reticular Fenestra genus itself has changed to Emiliano Huxley, which is famous today because it is one of the producers of the white water, the milky water effect that we see every uh, spring in the oceans. But there was another genus that was created at that time, and this is genus Coccolithus. The genus Coccolithus is, was a very characteristic of the time of the Eocene, and is less abundant today. And this genus is small, producing a small number of large coccoliths. These are the coccoliths, each one of them that they produce high calcite quota per, uh, per each cell. I mean, a large mass of calcium carbonate per cell. But, on the contrary, Ilyani Huxley today produces large number of smaller coccolids, and they produce low calcite quota producive per cell, and it is, as I said, presently abundant in the oceans. Something about, more about the Eocene. That's the, the way the Eocene, the world, looked like in the Eocene. There was a free passage of a seaway from the Indian Ocean to the Young Atlantic, and it is the time of the closure of the Thetis. We, the Levant region, are here. 
we can see the rectangle over here. And we are on the slopes or on a ramp that is beginning in Africa and Saudi Arabia and goes down to the deep ocean, still that that is, exists at that time. We also know the lithological characteristics, the facies of the rocks from the Eocene. In the early years, in the depression, we know the more formation. Anyone who visited of that knows it. It is a series of alternations of chocks and cherts. But it is changed in the middle Eocene, in the Nitsana formation, the lutetian, to chalk that is in, inter, interbedded with numulite limestone. And this numulite limestone was considered to be, years ago, as a mass movement, landslides of material coming from the nomadic area to a more distal one. Here are the research questions. The first, is there any pattern within the calcareous nanofossil assemblages at the Levant region? Is there any connection between patterns in assemblage and environmental contemporaneous factors like time, space? Is there any pattern that we can notice? Are these changes distinctable despite of the influence of mass movements of chalks and their genetic features that are so typical to chalk sedimentology all around the world, not only in Israel? <coughs> What was the mechanism that controlled the calcareous nanoplankton population response to paleoceanographic changes at the Levant region at that time? I present two data sets. The one is 200 samples covering 210 meters of integrated section of the Avedat Plateau. Here is Tempo Care, and here is the Avedat Plateau. As you remember, a lot of chalk. We have more than 200 meters of chalks. And this is representing the passage from early to middle Eocene through time. But also, I do present 200 samples from 13 short sections, beginning from the Arava Valley over here and ending in remote Menashe region, very close to where we are now. And this is covering the proximal to, supposed to be pro proximal to this position along the ramp of the ears. Let us begin from the integrated section of the Vedat Plateau. First, we have the integrated section, more Mitsana, Kosha, and Matre formations together. <coughs> and we have the lithologies. We have markers that are of calcareous nanofossils that are telling us what was the time. And by correlating these results to the IODP, the Ocean Drilling Project, we can give a real age, I mean absolute ages. And if we have absolute ages, we can calculate the rate of sedimentation. And this is the rate of sedimentation. And the rate of sedimentation was climbing in the Nitsana formation and have reached to uh, 23.6 meters in million years. Please, all the oceanographers of nowadays notice that we are talking in millions per years. We're not talking of uh, centimeters per thousand years. We don't have thousand years in geology. And by using this, we can build an age model. And the age model can assign to any point in of that a date, exact date. And if we have this exact date, then we can use it to a bit more. We can determine the zones, the areas of calcareous, different calcareous nanofossils, and we can compare it to what we know. First of all, let's determine the biostatigraphy. We have several zones, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, these are the names of the zones here. And we can put now the early to middle Eocene boundary exactly right here. This is the early middle Eocene boundary that is unites all we know in the world. I mean, if you look at the Americans, they will say, OK, this is, this, this is the same age. Now, let us look at the simple richness of calcareous land fossil. The simple richness of calcareous land fossil 
is the number of species, just number of species. You count how many species, different species you have, and you see that they reach a maximum over here in the NP14, 15 boundary, and then they decline. But counting number of species is a very boring task, and let us have a look at the prime fact uh, actors of one actor is the Chaos Molitus species. Chaos Molitus. Now it is, uh, sorry about the names. Okay, Chaos Molitus is, we call it Chaos Molitus because it has a cross in the middle part of it. And Chiasma is a cross. No, things that crosses. Okay, Chaos Molitus species. Look what it, it, it does the same thing. It appears to be climaxing and then decline. One more actor is the disco asters. The disco asters are called because they look like stars. Okay? And now they behave differently. They just decline when Chasmolithus is at its best. One more thing is reticular fenestra. The reticular fenestra, you remember here, the central area is reticulated. Okay? And they show that they are flourish at the end of the section. And coccolatus type, okay, the producers of carbonate are behaving just the opposite. So, we can make a correlation with global events. We can find where was the EECO. It was right over here. You remember when the disk clusters were, uh, uh, were at their best. We can also find the cooling stage and the stable stage we can correlate what's happening to the, to the rest of the world. Now let's do more than, than this. Let's test the environmental data using the age model. If we have an age model, we can take the sea level changes, the Arabian plate sea level changes, and we can take, we can take the isotopes of Zakos, if you, somebody knows, Zakos is the, fa the famous isotope of the Paleogene the curve, and we can try and use also the rate of sedimentation using the age model. And we are trying to, to ask a question. What, was the best, what is the best correlation? What is the most significant factor that influenced the Levant region at that time? The first, and this is the test. And the tests give us these results. Lithology is well correlated. And we're using the Spearman rank because this is not um, a parametric test. And the lithology is well correlated with the rate of sedimentation, but because it is very well correlated, it is removed. You should remove from the test a bad, a two, two good correlations because they mask the, the, the all other uh, variables. And the other variables are the delta, I mean the isotopes, and the rate of sedimentation gives you a nice accepted correlation, but sea level changes gives so low correlation that it is rejected. Sea level changes did not exert any influence on the Levant region at that time. We go a bit further and we define what I call the XD ratio. The XD ratio is the ratio between the Chiasmolitus and this cluster because Chiasmolitus are known as cool, high trophic level forms. And these clusters are known by literature as warm and low trophic level forms. So if we use this ratio, the abundance of Chiasmolitus, divided by the abundance of both Chiasmolitus and these clusters, we will, can learn something about what is happening to the population. Here is the XD ratio. And here's the simple richness that we saw before. And the number of species increases as the XD ratio goes up, but the saturation level is occurred. And this means that calcareous nanofossils cannot give more than they have. The simple richness can go up and up, but it reaches some sort of a saturation. Other groups of calcareous nanofossils show just a different behavior. 
So this hole is true at the large scale of the of that plateau, and it represents several million years interval. But I am asking more than this. Is there any pattern of variance within the assemblage in small, say, 10 to 100 thousand years scale, which is the difference between each one of the bed sets in, of that? And therefore, I used the second data set, which is a short section, a traverse on the Levant region of Israel, beginning from the Arava Valley and ending in the Ramon Menashe, very close to Dalia, Kibbutz Dalia. And we have a high resolution traverse of short section along Israel's Eocene exposure that is covering 270 kilometers from the Arab Valley to the Menashe region, and it is believed to be a traverse from proximal to distal position in the ocean of the Thales. We have different basins of the Syrian arcs. Do you remember the Syrian arc at that time? So we have different basins. Do they matter? We have proximal to distal position, and we have different ages from in the equation notation. Now, it's like chess. I'm putting now uh, the tools of the game. We have biotic variables, which are uh, groups of calcareous nanofossils of the Eocene. We have what I call environmental variables, which are reworking stable isotope signals, trophic level, and etc. Now we have to use them all. I give you two examples here, and the first example is Nahal Sefer section from the Lutetian NP14, which is the middle Eocene, and you see that the Nahal Sefer section is com comprised of bed sets of indurated limestone and chalk. I call them the first set, the second set, and the third set. And let us look at the results of calcareous nanofossils. And what you can see, okay, here are the bed sets, one, two, three, and name H1, H2, H3. And you can see Chaosmolitis is doing the same. It's going down towards each one of the bed sets. Whereas the discoasters behave just the opposite, antithetically, just as was expected. But I expected this from the large section of, of that. We have it here in one or two meters. It's happening the same. So we can calculate the XD ratio from the Hatzechel section. And here it is, the XD ratio. And what we have is a trophic level changes in short section, in short escapes. This is a short section. We also have smaller coccolith. Look how they behave. And large coccolith. And the end, and my question was, what is what's happening to the larger coccolith, to the carbonate producing? So when I measured the coccolith's length. Here it is. This is a coccosphere, and each one of them is a coccolith. And we can measure, of course, under scanning electron microscope, the length and the width of this coccolith. And here is the results of, I don't know, I think um, 1,500. I think 1,500 uh, measurements, and this is the correlation. It's nice. I mean, this is natural science. <laughs> you wouldn't expect more than this. And by applying this equation, I can have the length, but also the circularity. It is called the, isomet the isometry. I mean, if they are grown, but they are have an isometric grown, they are grown all the same, by width and length. But if not, they are twisted. And the answer is, they're not twisted. They just grow. And more than this, if it is uh, projected against the XD ratio, as when the, the XD ratio is at its lowest, you remember the trophic level is at its, low, at its lowest value, you will have the largest carbonate producers. They produce more carbonate when the trophic level is very low. So as the XD ratio declines, higher calcium quota per cell is produced. One more section. I will not 
give you the whole, the whole, second, the whole 13 sections. It's a lot of work. But I'm sorry. Another, yes. Quick question. What is your proxy for traffic level? What is the proxy? The proxy for traffic level is the XD ratio. I will re return to the definition of the XD ratio in of that. Okay, here it is. Because in literature, we know that chiasmolytis is known as cool and high trophic level form. And the discourser is known in the literature, in literature as warm and low trophic level forms, the typical of the EECO forms. Then the ratio of them should give us, because uh, the denominator is chiasmolytis, should give us what's happened to the trophic level at that time. Um, okay, just a minute, I'll go back to... Thank you. Oh, it's okay. And um, one, just one more section to, to show you the complexity of this work. I refer to give out Goral Road Cut, which is very close to Beersheba. Those who want to bypass Beersheba should drive in this. They don't want to stop in Beersheba. And the question is, do sim genetic mass movements of chalk affect by any chance the assemblages of calcareous nanofossils in the Eocene? Maybe the only thing I see here is just the chalk who's moved from an eritic point to the, uh, to the distal point and brings us calcareous nanofossils that do not belong here. So this is, it might be a fraud. And therefore it is in terms of calcareous nanofossils, if it is true, then the fan or channel assemblage over here should not be similar with the deep basin assemblage, but it should be more similar to the neuritic assemblage over here. This is the test I'm going to produce now. And here it is. Here is the Gevaud Goral section. Here, the, the bad sets look fine. And here are the bad sets as they look at a certain point. You see, it's almost cross section, it's a cross bedding. The upper part was considered by Bouchbider et al. in 1988 as a result of mass movements of chalk that go down the slope. So if it is a mass movement of chalk, then, how, then I should test what's happening to the calcareous nanofossil here and calcareous nanofossil there and see if there's any difference. Um, that's the way I just put it on the graphic. It is exaggerated horizontally, of course. And OK, we have normal concordant data, uh, strata. We have a channel infill and Q-mode cluster analysis Okay, with a simple test is testing the Geva Ot Goral against, of that plateau, against the, old, the results of ODP 1209, they think that this is pelagic assemblages, and against the results of Wilson Lake in New Jersey, those who publish it think that this is an neuritic assemblage. Let's see if it correlates with what's happening to us. Okay, and here are the results, and i just give you the, the bottom line. Three groups of samples are three repetitions of data patterns according to bad sets. So they don't care about what's happening in the, uh, the difference between the upper and the lower part. They just know, uh, the computer just know that there are three types of bad sets. The whole section shows similarity in assemblage, indifferent to the occurrence of the depositional channel over here. The whole derived section is more similar to of that plateau. And this is fun because we know that we are in the same Levant region. And the Avedat plateau in Israel is closer to the Shotsky Rise site, the oceanic assemblage of ODP 1209, which means that we are pelagic. There is no neuritic assemblage here in this area. So no neuritic assemblage in the channel infill, and the channel infill resembles to the basin assemblages. It didn't come from far away. It's all from here. And there is no influence of mass movement over calcareous nanofossil assemblages. And the last one of the results will be the delta C13 values. 
I did not use the delta O18 paleothermometer because it is subjected to diagenesis. And we don't want this diagenesis to interfere. But delta C13 is considered to be a, a well proxy. And here is the delta C13 values against the X, once again, the XD ratio of the, uh, of NP12, NP14, NP15. You remember these are the zones of calcareous manifolds, beginning from the early Eocene and the middle Eocene. It looks like a curve, but it's not. We begin with the early Eocene samples, and now the early Eocene samples shows, as expected, low values of XD ratio, of trophic level, but they show a very large and a range of delta C13. But the, on the opposite side, in the middle Eocene, we saw, we can see here a very short, relatively short range of delta C13 by but a very high range of the XD ratio. And remember, these were the oligotrophic conditions, and these were the higher conditions of the middle Eocene. So the early Eocene show wide range of delta C14 values. This is oligotrophic. And the middle Eocene shows lower and more concise value, values of higher trophic level. And the summary until here is we have large scale, the trophic level in the Levant region has increased almost by three folds during the transition from early to middle Eocene. Sea level changes play only a minor, but I say nothing. No sea level changes in this area. I mean, there were sea level changes, but they did not exert any change on calcareous nanofossil. The trophic level, as expressed mainly by population, is correlated with stable isotopes, and as the trophic level elevated, the producers of calcium per cell decreased. We saw that. And in a small scale, the alternations of chalks and indurated or chirps just imitate the same procedure that happened in the large scale is happening in small scales. And I'll just jump because of the time to the final conclusion. Relationship between calcium production and trophic level cannot be linearly correlated and are actually antithetic. So we already have some idea of okay. yes. Just one question. Sorry. Yes. What is the more or less the the bottom depth at that time? What Yes, so so. They would not give you the bottom no. depth because they live on the photic side. But stone. where do we... Uh, there was no work in Israel showing the, the, the bottom depth. My, my supervisor, Chaim Benjamini, claims that this is 1,000 meters about, this is a bathiel. Uh, we only know from the work of Robert Speyer in, the Belg in Belgium that worked in Egypt. And by the Paleocene, he says that it should be more than 600 meters. That's what he said. He didn't, he didn't, he, he didn't perform any work here. He worked in, in Egypt, but he said, OK, this is the rheotic zone. Everything that happened in the Levant in Israel should be more than 600 meters. But nobody was actually was doing a work like this. So I assume it's 700 meters. 800. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. Just to answer this question, we published a model two years ago, Sergei Vetal with Vladimir Lichovsky. We calculated the water depth, the panoptimetry of the Eocene, and it falls in the same, with the same numbers as, as you say. The numbers are just. The Kavan region was about uh, 1.8 uh, kilometers. 1.8 kilometers? Yes. Well, this is the bathium. This is bathium. Yes, yes, but the bathium. And the negative was a little bit uh, shallower, but uh, around what you say. This is what I took here. Because I'll be very happy to read your works, but this is what, what I took as, as a for granted here. Yes. I will be very happy to read this one. So, we already have some idea about calcareous nanofossils today, and the idea is like this. Coccolithophores, though showing preferences to mesotrophications, still do not bloom at the highest stage of nutrient enrichment process. They don't like too many nutrients. 
and cognitive force bloom do not peak in alignment with, in time with other phytoplankton groups such as diatoms, dinoflagellates, and cyanobacteria. They don't like each other. You have separate time and separate environments of calcareous nanofossils and nanoplankton. So there is a trophic windows of cognitophores, and probably this trophic window existed also in the time of the EOC, although the, the ocean was different at that time. And here is the suggested model for the calcareous nanofossils and trophic level changes in the early the middle Eocene transition. And it goes like this. If we, uh, I'll skip this. I, I just want to show you that um, there was a change also if we use trace fossil. And we can see that well oxygenated sediments and poorly oxygenated sediments uh, also exist with high and low X D ratio and a different an antithetic relationship with calcium quota production. So this is, it's about the time to give you some explanations. I was just promising things, and here are some explanations. These changes might be described with the use of a phase diagram. Here is the phase diagram. And as all phase diagrams have two axes, the organic flux, which is the elevation in trophic level, produces organic flux to the, uh, to the sea bottom. And this is the calcite producing creatures. Now, there is a triangle over here. And this low triangle is the high trophic level with the forms that are typical. And the low trophic level are over here, the disclusters and coccolitus, and the oligotrophic conditions. And let us begin by elevating the trophic level. If I elevate the trophic level, the first response of calcareous nanofossils will be to produce a lot of calcium carbonate. These are the forms that produce the disclaster and coccolithus stuff. Let us increase even more the trophic level. Oops. Now, the calcium, calcium carbonate production is falling down. The population is changing right now. And what we have is less carbonate produced, but a lot of organic flux that reaches the surface. And what will happen if we increase even more the trophic level? The answer is very simple. There will be no calcareous nanofossil, no coccolithophores anymore. Because they couldn't tolerate this high level of calcareous non of um, sorry, nutrient. Let's test it. Let's test this implication and we Test it using by plots of component or factor analysis method. You can use any factor analysis method that you want. I use the PCA, the principal component analysis. And it goes like this. The first of all, the first step is to realize that the solution to this model is log normal behavior of the population. Here it is. It looks like this. This is a log normal. As I said before, it's not normal. It's a log normal. Okay, so it is skewed. In the beginning of the trophic level, you get low trophic level by high carbonate production, and then it is changing. Let's see. Totally oligotrophic conditions will have no coccolithal force at all. You gain nothing by nothing. You need to produce something. So there is no test, and we are over here, somewhere here. Small changes in trophic level, abrupt rise in carbonate flux. So. Please have notice here the XD ratio should be aligned with the D delta C 13. Let us produce small trophic level. The maximum of carbonate production of coccolithophores is reached, but there is no change in carbonate flux. So these vectors should be indifferent. They don't care about each other anymore. And we are here. Further elevation of the trophic level, mesotrophication, will lead, will lead to population turnover. The carbonate flux will decrease, and then the relation will be the opposite. More XD, less delta C13. We are here. And what will happen if we get to a high eutrophication? The answer is, no coccolithophores anymore, no test, 
We can do nothing with this. We are somewhere here. So let's take, take these and, and, and make an implement on what we saw. The proximal po position of the Arava Valley, for example, by the earlier scene, dictates higher trophic level. Here are the PCA, and I just emphasize what happens to the vectors, not to the vectors. Here's the delta C13, and here is the XD ratio. They are, of course, with the error, you, you always have an error, but they are, you, you might say that they are uh, antithetic. And the answer is yes, the trophic conditions in the Arava Valley were relatively high by the early Eocene. Remember, we are here. And the second, how did the trophic level change in the Arava in the middle Eocene? And here is the projection. Here is the XD ratio. It goes like this. And the trophic condition decreased. And the production of carbonate was elevated. We actually moved there. And now, so that's me. did you plot a, a screen diagram for your PC? Did I plot a screen plot? A screen plot? Yes, I did. Oh yeah, I, I, of course. We have all these PCAs should be followed by tests to verify, and the answer is it expands. Uh, my limit was it should expand at least seventy-five percent of the data. It did. Uh, expense and more than 75% uh, of the data. And you, you, you are right, I should give this the screen plot, but <laughs> of course not here. And if you might want, to, I, I'll give you the results. Yes, it, it, it was very fun. Testing the overall response. What factor affects the variance among the assemblage? Was it the time? Was it the different basins at the time of the Eocene? Or was it the distant position? And what I did is a two-way nested anosim. Anosim is a non-parametric version of ANOVA. And the answer is, the first factor was the time. Only the trophic, mesotrophic conditions change with time in the ears. The second was the distality, if you were close to the Arava or away from the Arava. And the third, and almost not important, was the basin. So if you have different basins of the Syrian arc, it did not exert any change or any influence on calcareous nanofossils. And this means that the photic zone was free. Nothing actually disturbed calcareous nanofossils, nanoplankton, from being the same all over the Levant region. So it's the end. The population of calcareous nanoplankton in the Eocene of the Levant region was primarily influenced by the con and contemporaneous trophic level, more than in sea level. Sea level and onlap curves did not exert any change. Early diagenetic process, preservation and delta C13 were all expressions of organic matter accumulation. Actually, this was the expression of this delta C13. According to the suggested model, the response of calcareous nanoplankton population did not co-variate with the trophic level elevation because increasing trophic level acts differently on different groups of calcareous nanoplankton and a high calcite quota was produced by oligotrophic adapted forms such as coccolithus forms. The highest trophic conditions prevailed in the Arava Valley by the early Eocene and then equalized with the northern or more distal parts of the Levant Ram. And the alternations of chalk and chucks are an expression of small scale, 40 to 100,000 years. Some might say that 40 to 100,000 years reminds them of the Milankovic cycles, but I don't dare to say the Milankovic cycles on the ERC. And these are processes of the same mechanism along the Levant. And Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we've got two minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Menachem. Uh, any questions, please? Okay. I'm just uh, curious, in your uh, the species um, diversity, 
uh, you've concentrated on you know, the main actors that are dominating, but did you also come across some sort of rare, more rarely occurring species that gave you oh, yes. uh, that matched up with these these cycles? Sure. When I say the number of species, we have 105 spe different species. I count them all. Now, in order to see which are the, the most important species, there is one more thing, one more test, and this is the simple test. There is a test to show what, which one of the species gives you the most significant uh, signal. Which are the most significant? And what I did here, what I show you here, is actually after conducting this test, I say, okay, all the rest are not important. They belong to the number of species, but these are the most important okay, taxa. I wouldn't even call it species. Groups. No, sorry. <laughs> okay. It's more of a basic question, but when you look at the sediments themselves, what do you find? you find the coccolis or the whole...? 80, almost 90% of coccolis, 90%, 5 to 7% of foraminifera, mostly planktic. No, are you looking at tests at the The sphere or the... I cut, I cut and crush the sediment. Okay. Put it in water and you make several stages and put it on the slide just like you would do it on preparates in the so biology. You don't see the whole organism, you just see the slide. Oh, you cannot see the whole organism. Oh, first of all, the organism is not alive anymore. No. What you might see is the coccosphere, yeah. which is the structure, the whole structure. Sometimes you see it. If you're lucky, then you see it. It's very nice to Mostly see. Mostly you organism. see the coccolates. And therefore, I was very much cautious, cautious by telling, oh, this is a species. Because we have a poly a, a, a situation of, a, of several a, a, a forms that are belong to the same species. It's much more complicated. So what I, maybe my question is, so how do you decide on the number if you only have a fraction of the organism? Oh, this is uh, because what you do, you count the coccolids of a genus and even a family. I don't really care if they were at the same species or not. They have the same characteristics. These are optical characteristics. How do you decide on a decline or a decrease of number? Oh, I, I only see a larger coccolid. So, it is very, okay, it is basic. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Coccolids might be produced as large coccolids per one coccosphere, but there are small numbers. That's what we know today by experiments. Okay? Now, if you produce a large coccolid, you produce a lot more calcium carbonate than producing small coccolids, but many of them. And this is because the power of the length is on the third power, and so you have to produce more uh, 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 little uh, uh, coccolids to produce calcium carbonate. So Coccolithus pelagicus even today produces very large coccolids, produces a lot of calcium carbonate per cell, mm -hmm. but not many co uh, co coccolids per coccosphere. Um, sorry, yes. Can you answer questions, please? Okay, you, you said that uh, this coccosphere is growing iso isometrically. No, there's a coccolith growing ah, isometrically. Okay. I, I'll show you what I mean. I have to move to the... Oh, sorry. Here it is. Okay, let's make definitions. A few definitions. This is a coccosphere. This is a coccolid. One coccolid. Now, the cell itself, the organic cell, the living cell, is there within. We cannot see it from here. Because the coccosphere uh, enclose the, the living cell. Actually, if you took it to a sound, it's going to get into the microscope, you kill it. You, you won't see it now. But it's over deep inside. Now, it can produce a lot of coccolids. Or 
or can produce less coccolith, but they are much bigger, larger coccoliths. And there is a ratio between the length of each coccolith to the calcite quota, to the, to the mass of calcite. And this relation is a multiplication of several uh, uh, items with the length of the coccolith in third power. Because it's a volume. It's a volume. So, yes. Did you, did you test those with maybe your long axis and your short axis? Did you check which one is the best indicator of the morphometry in the uh, if you combine it to the calcite, whatever production, will you test that before you said it's the length that is the best indicator? No, I didn't because it was published. Oh, good. All, all I did was um, using the, the works of uh, Patricia Tiveri and, and Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Young in London. They have already done this, and they said, okay, if you have a large coccolith, you produce high cancer quota. So all I say, okay, you said that. I have large coccolith towards the end of each bed set, more calcium was produced. Now, if I tested this in on living, I just come from their work. I think they did a good work. The Natural History Museum in London. They, could, they did good work. So maybe I'll ask you, so what's in your mind that the reason for cyclicity both on a shorter time scale, on Milankovic's time scale, on a, a million years time scale, why? I am a bit afraid, I must tell you, telling the name Milankovic, because, uh, the, no, 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 because the, theory, the theory of Milankovic, the theory of Milankovic was about, let's say, a million years or two million years before present, no more than this. That's what he thought. He didn't think of the, the Eocene at that time. So what happened in the Eocene? I do believe that it is climatic. I do believe that it's paleoceanography. We have pulses of, of um, um, you might say, upwellings. You have pulses of enrichments in nutrients. But what was the basis for this? Where did it come from? I might say that it's come from the south, from the Arava region. Why? I really don't know. This is something that m must be or should be studied. In, 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 I know, but, but the Milankovitch is, I mean, I'm talking about this procession of, you know, of the equinox and, and things like that, you know, it's the, it's the rotation of the earth, but while... I didn't say it, so it wasn't, I didn't say it wasn't. I just think that you, you might, as, as we, we talk, the, 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 the ocean of the Eocene was so much different from the ocean of today, it was most stagnant. It has less energy of, of, of uh, because you didn't have ice caps at that time, uh, and, and it was sluggish uh, circulation. And therefore, I don't, I'm hesitating whether to say the word Milankovic, that is actually more something that is more belongs to, to the present or to the recent. Now, I know there are scientists that say without any hesitation, oh, these are the Milankovic. Many scientists in Europe have looked at the charts of Europe and said, oh, these are the Milankovic cycles. I don't know. I, just personally, I'm, I'm not, I, I do not consider that it is proven uh, that Milankovic cycles, the way they are today, exist at that time. Yeah, but, but it also existed on, on, on the several million year cycle, the same, the same phenomenon that you have shown. No, it, shown it, you say the middle, you, you know, the oh, entire period. You know. in, the large, in the large scale, yeah. the change was because of, as I showed you the first, the, 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 the first graph of Zakos, it was because we had a change in temperature, we had a change in climate. It was an abrupt not abrupt, actually, a large change in climate. So, of course, when it got cooler and cooler, the, the water uh, stratification was actually uh, interfered and changed as the temperature go cooler and you, you have more eutrophication. This is okay. But on the large scale, for this, although it is 40,000 years, it's very nice, it very much looks, uh, on the small scale, it looks very much like the Milankovic cycles. But I personally am not sure that we should call Milankovic cycle things that happen at that sea of the Eocene. It's my 
It's my hesitation. It's a personal hesitation. Okay, any other question? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you very much.